Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. Joining me, besides the lovely bunch of women in the films, mm-hmm. is uh, Michael Kester. Hello. On this glorious evening of Double Feature. Yeah. This is one of those uh, kind of stay up late nights. It is. It's super late. You know, you wait till everybody in your house or your apartment is sleeping. Maybe, uh, maybe you wind down for the last, I don't know, three to eight hours of the day uh-huh. watching the first film. And then once everybody's asleep, you watch the second film. So what are those two movies? We're doing Girl Interrupted and Reform School Girls. It's kind of an, let's say, an all-night girl slumberathon of double yeah. features. Yeah, girl night slumber party. You let the uh, the insane girls wear you down, and then you continue to party with the Reform School Girls. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the setup. Sanity questionable. It's safe to say they're all pretty fucking insane. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe more sane people in the first movie, mm-hmm. actually. But uh, we're going to spoil. We're going to tell you who's insane and who's not insane. That's right. We're spoiled both. Question. We should say, uh, you know what? It's the version of Reform School Girls from 86. Uh-huh. I know there's a lot of other ones floating around there. If there's lots of numbers after them, you're probably watching pornography and not the, <laughs> uh, not the women in prison film that we're watching today, which is fine. You could probably still yeah. follow along with the show. It's probably pretty close. But uh, if you find that your pornography is not being spoiled, but instead a movie you've never heard of, mm-hmm. you can skip it using chapters. The chapters are embedded in the feed, so we're going to start with Girl Interrupted, Mm -hmm. and then we're going to move to Reform School Girls. Right. Uh, One other thing I should mention is that, so we paired this up. We wanted to just talk about, you know, systems of reformation and all women, uh, double features. And sometimes you really try and match the temperature of Uh a feature, you know, try and get two movies that go together uh, in accordance to a a lot of different things, pacing, mood, what have you. And other times... If the first movie is a brooding drama over two hours long in length, perhaps, Uh you go with something like Reform School Girls at the end. So maybe not a double feature party you want to have. Yeah, uh, probably not so much. So we'll start in the 60s with Girl Interrupted. Right. Um, I guess it's the late 60s. Well, it starts, yeah, I guess it is the late 60s, probably around 67 or 68. And it's uh, it's dealing with what I once described, I think during the Attic Expeditions, as something I had a strange fascination with. Which is Seth the Green. crazy. I love the oh, crazy. Sorry. It was Seth. It was actually Seth Green in that movie yeah. who was batshit insane. And uh, some of the other people in there who were crazy as well. And now we have this complete cast of crazies. Yep. So a couple people in the movie that we need to talk about. Mm-hmm. First, there's Jeffrey Tambor, who's yep. from Arrested Development. Yes. And Jared Leto, who's from 30 Seconds to Mars. Right. We saw him when we did Lord of War. And also Fight Club. All right. Uh, he was the blondie in Fight yeah. Club. Not to be confused with Blondie from Spun. Right. Which has Brittany Murphy, who's also in this movie. Holy crap. I'm playing some kind of weird Kevin Bacon game using name association. Uh-huh. I don't think that's how that works. Kevin Bacon, a person who's, what, never been in Double Feature? Never once been in on Double, Double Feature. Feature. Was, was he, he in one of the slasher oh, franchises? He was in, he's in the first Friday the 13th. Why are we talking about Kevin Bacon? We'll get to Friday the 13th Cook today. your Kevin Bacon at six degrees. So we have Angela Bettis, mm-hmm. who plays Janet. Who we saw in May. Yeah, and who we don't see enough. Not actually. nearly enough. Poor fucking Angela Bettis will never get the credit she deserves. And in keeping up with that, we'll move right along. We have Clay <laughs> Duvall as well. So Clay Duvall is from Carnival. Right. And um, She's in the faculty. And that thing about cheerleaders, what's that movie called? But I'm a Cheerleader, I think it is. Is that the name? Of, is that really the name of a movie? Yeah, it's about oh. masturbating cheerleaders. Have no. you not seen that? No. I almost don't believe you, actually. So, Clay Duvall is amazing. She plays, uh, I think it's Georgina in this movie. And also another actor who just doesn't get enough roles. Or maybe not enough roles I'm interested in. Yeah, that's I think that's it. what it is. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much all of these actors. Yeah, for the it's most part. It's not like they don't get work. Yeah, that's actually Except true. Angela Bettis. Well, the thing, the thing for me is, uh, so we also have um, Winona Ryder. Of course. Who... Um, Scanner Darkly. Right. Edward Scissorhands was mm-hmm. the other one. Beetlejuice as well. Oh, God. Yeah, we kind of owe this movie to Winona Absolutely. Ryder. She does a great job in the film. She um, she produced the thing as well. She tried to get, a, I guess she partnered with a guy who had rights to the uh, the book or whatever, huh. Double Sleeping Nap Time. 
and uh, and got the thing made, and it's pretty fucking awesome in it, especially yeah. towards the end. Oh, everybody yeah. really ponies up the uh, the well, emotion at the end. So the the third actor that we should probably credit here before we get into talking about the actual character arcs, which I'd like to get into. Yeah, yeah, is Angelina Jolie. Oh, of course. I guess we glossed over Brittany Murphy, who was Daisy too. Oh, but, I totally uh, forgot about that. Well, well I, you mentioned her. We Kevin Bacon away from her, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Angelina Jolie. So this is, I, I remember weeks back, maybe months back at this point, mm-hmm. um, this is what happens when you watch double features late into the night is I just have no concept of time. We mentioned, hey, girl interrupted. That's probably a thing we should do. That might be a good idea. Turns out, good idea. Uh-huh. But uh, I think one of the reasons that came up, or I've been thinking about it a lot lately, is every once in a while, we go through this life, I try and figure out what crazy people, and by crazy people, I mean totally normal, average people, why they do something that I don't understand. Uh-huh. Why sports or religion are, are mainstream things, and I just yep. I don't get them. And every once in a while, I figure out a tiny facet of human existence, and it, it's small, Michael. It's marginal. But today, I get Angelina Jolie. Okay. I mean, maybe not today, but when uh-huh. I first saw Girl mm-hmm. Interrupted. I understood after this this long amount of time of her being, you know, this huge celebrity, world yeah. renowned, everybody talking about her all the fucking time, going through her movies and trying, just going back and back and back and never, I got to around Tomb Raider and I was ready to give uh-huh. up. And then I got to Girl Interrupted. Right. And suddenly it all made sense to me. It was this moment where I finally just fucking get it. So Angelina Jolie plays Lisa. Uh huh. She is fucking crazy. If anyone yes, there is crazy, absolutely. I think she gets labeled what a sociopath. Yeah, she's a sociopath. Which on the hierarchy of crazy is what like first place. Yeah, it's real high up. It's there. the top prize. It's probably the highest level of crazy that you can have clarity. Almost maniacally so. Yeah, she's uh, manipulative. She knows. She's aware of her crazy. Yeah. She just uh, she chooses to deny sanity. Right. And I think that's a lot of what's going on in the movie, or what the movie rather would like us to think is sure. going on is that these people deny sanity. Mm-hmm. And if there's ever an example of that, it's, you know, it's Lisa. So I don't know if you want to call it charisma. I think that's a cheap word to just throw around at actors, although it's something uh-huh. all the time. It's all I understand. Right. So I'm constantly saying, Hey, this person's charismatic. This person's uh-huh. charismatic. That's why I like them. Um, Angelina Jolie has charisma. She has, uh, I guess I just buy the crazy so much. Yeah. I think that's what interests me in her in this role is not that she's an icon, not that she's being treated like a supermodel within a film, but rather that she just breathes fucking insanity. I believe every moment of it. I never know what she's going to do. Yeah. She's unpredictable. And the fact that she's unpredictable in a very, almost an exploitation sense, uh-huh. uh, almost the reform school girl sense it makes me enjoy when she comes into a scene yeah, because it breaks up whatever was happening. And this is an interesting thing for Girl Interrupted because the movie lays on some pretty heavy concepts. Yeah. You know, we can talk a lot of uh, big picture things, big mm-hmm. picture ideas, especially, you know, a movie about Reformation in the 60s, right? Uh, dealing with the culture of the 60s. So sometimes we might get bogged down in what does the movie mean? What is the movie purporting about soft sciences? You know, that type of thing. These deep emotional character arcs. And then Angelina Jolie comes in right about when we're getting a handle on what the fuck is going on and just stir shit up. Yeah. She just makes everybody, she brings out the crazy in other people. Sure. I I always feel like my, I think my only problem with her role and and it's totally intentional. So this is more of a credit than anything. Right. But I just always feel like she's detracting from some of the other characters in the room because right. but that's her role is to be You mean the, from their growth or from who they are? From their part yeah, from who their they are from, to shine. from well just from their kind of a, a, another chance for them to be exposed as, you know, another layer of their being because right. she comes into a room and she has to be the focus and the not as an attention. actor as sure. a character. Right, right. And that's a lot, I mean, that's a lot of the premise of the film is that she is this gravitational force that just kind of sucks up attention and, and all this thought. And I mean, that's, she's the driving force behind the majority of Winona Ryder's descent into insanity. Well, and for the longest time in my life, I've been interested in these crazy people, uh, crazy women, especially, I think there's just a layer of not understanding even more so Mm -hmm. than somebody I might identify with a little bit more for being male. Right. Um, which may or may not be the case. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But 
uh, I consider myself a pretty rational sane person, although I've had crazy moments surely in my life as a lot of people have. And I think, uh, I think that's part of what the movie gets to is, you know, what's crazy and what's just taboo or if there's a difference between those two things. And so, you know, although I consider myself rational and most of the people I know are rational and the older I get, the less insane people I have in my life, the crazy ones just fucking make for so much more interesting stories. that's true. And for you to question things you might not have even, you know, your grip on reality is so firm or so well held. And then one of these people comes in and they question things that you just consider totally okay. Mm -hmm. You take for granted. Yeah. They start making you question maybe even your own ability to question things. Yeah. Now if we're following around Susanna, you know, she gets herself into this, uh, into this boarding school Mm. or what have you. What would you call this place? Let's call it an asylum. That makes me yeah, more interested in the like situation. It's like a minimum security women's asylum, I guess. Sure. Not a women's correctional facility, right. but a women's asylum. And it's always more exploitative when you put the term women in the, in the thing you're describing. She gets in here basically, uh, partially because her parents suck. Mm-hmm. You know, They do make a point of really pointing out that she got herself here. She signed herself in. Yeah. And she, of course, then can't sign herself out. That whole system is kind of nutty to me, especially when you get in the private sector, because what if the money runs out? You know, yeah. you have to pay for that. But her parents, we see the thing early on where they're worried she'll embarrass them uh, in the party by the clothes she's wearing. Mm-hmm. They don't even want to drop her off, which is really awful. Oh, yeah. That they can't even, you know, they just want to detach themselves. They want the problem to be out of their sure. hands. Well, they don't want to be associated with having fucked up essentially exactly exactly and one of the last moments you even see them you see probably what's the most traumatic experience for them not even you know their daughter going away you know possibly forever uh for reform but when they check back in and when they find out that this thing she has this uh bipolar disorder multiple personalities soft uh-huh. science whatever that it might be hereditary then they lose it right So I think the film's giving us a lot of information about her parents, even though we barely see Mm -hmm. them, about why they sort of put her there, about uh, what they think. You know, they seem to have these fears about themselves, even in the the brevity and in the small moments we see them. The actual crazy that we get is a pretty large variety. Yeah. So we talked about the Lisa crazy. Sure. We talked about uh, ruining things for other people, self-destructive nature. I guess that's part of it, too. Sure. Um, Susanna's crazy seems to be... More questioning whether she's crazy or yeah, not. Yeah, her crazy is kind of this weird meta insanity. Sure. Where her insanity stems from whether or not she's insane. Sure, right, right. And uh, and then we have we have some more, I guess, standard versions of insanity, which would probably fall under Janet, who is anorexic or bulimic. Probably anorexic, right? Okay. Cynthia, who's a, a lesbian. Mm-hmm. That's clearly nuts. Madness. Clearly nuts. Madness of all types. In its highest form, sir. <laughs> um, and then we have some of the you know, the less functional people who are either entirely vegetative or kind of remedialized in their, you know, interactions with people. But the two possibly most interesting cases are gonna be Georgina mm-hmm. and Polly. Yeah. I I keep forgetting Daisy, Brittany Murphy, but sure. honestly, I always forget she's in this film and every time I watch it, she's my favorite part. Yeah, yeah. Uh the movie doesn't focus a lot on her until it kind of comes around at the end because she disappears for a mm-hmm. while. She vanishes because she's okay, maybe. Yeah. She's got um, an Indian chicken. Yeah, and we'll come back to Daisy because her fucked up is all sorts of fucked up. It's all sorts of interesting fucked up. Many, many uh symptoms of the problem there. But if you look at someone like Polly, who, I mean, Polly might be in a, maybe a bit of a childlike state. Mm-hmm. She, uh, obviously. Allegedly. I mean, toward the end yeah. of the film, that kind of gets called out as possibly being bullshit. It makes you question, you know, the level of even other people's symptoms. And their interpretation mm-hmm. of what, you know, of what she's talking about. Uh, Polly's really nice because she has a burn. That yeah. seems to be the extent of, you know, they make us believe that there might be something deeper there. But then uh, once the the curtain gets pulled back, it looks like it might be that. I mean, do you get the impression that it's that simple? Yeah, it could be. It's just it's it's something like I think the the kind of insanity fits in there that it's become such an obsession that she has to be nice all the time. And she never detaches herself from, I guess, compensating for the burn on her face. 
So a therapist might call that an emotional scar as well as a physical one? I would never, I don't know. And then you have Georgina's problem, which is that she tells lots of lies. Yeah, she's a pathological liar, which... Clearly a huge disorder that needs to be uh, right. needs to be dealt with institutionally. Well, a lot of these disorders, again, Daisy aside, are kind of touched. It, so we're dealing with it in the 60s, mm-hmm. which is before the advent of ADD. Right. Which, I mean, kind of still lumps into this category where a lot of these things taking lesbianism as a shining example. Yeah. Not insanity. Telling really? lies no? is not being crazy. I oh, mean, these crap. are back in the 60s. There were probably different interpretations of, you know, social norms. And so if you were not conforming to a social normalcy, then you would just be lumped in with probably being crazy. So telling too many lies, whereas now people fucking I'm sure there are more people that lie more. You think so? Outside. Now? Well, there's definitely more. Oh, outside of the institution. Yeah. Yeah, because everybody else has their own problems they need sure. to deal with. I thought you were trying to tell me that there's more people who lie today than in the 60s. Oh, no, no. I'm saying that... Which I'm is s- probably true because there's more people today. Right. But, but I'm yeah, just I saying that saying. I think fewer liars are institutionalized is probably the best way yeah, to yeah. put it. Well, this gets into a, a broader theme. It's kind of an interesting theme because it's something the movie really hits home. But at the same time, probably because the movie's as long as it is, it covers as many things as it does it seems a little bit uh, more subtle. They don't talk about it time-wise very much, but you see examples of it throughout. And that is, I guess, this kind of, you know, we're thinking back to the 60s, let's call it Mm nonconformity, this sort of um, idea of doing something taboo or getting away from the norms, just living outside of the standard idea of what life should be like, especially for women. And then, you know, that versus what is complete insanity. So how do you know when someone is maybe just has a little bit different lifestyle? How do you know when they're insane? Mm -hmm. And that starts to get into a really philosophical question that you could ask even today. It's easier to look back at the 60s and go, oh, lesbians, they were insane. Ha ha, laugh at that. Uh And then today with our enlightened times say, well, clearly all lesbians aren't by default insane because they like other women. Sure. But then, you know, you can get into more complicated problems and say, I guess what I'm saying is I believe there is a level of insanity. Um, but I think most of the things that lead up to that ultimate needs to be in- institutionalized insanity are kind of bullshit. Or at least after seeing a movie like this, it's hard to disagree with that. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, look at Susanna's case. She wants to be a writer. That's yep. basically why she's institutionalized. Mm-hmm. You know, she we have the, uh, you know, lesbians being unorthodox and that being nuts. But she's then sitting in a room and her only real crime seems to be that one, she wants to be a writer and two, she doesn't realize that that makes her a crazy person. Right. And that's really it, right? I mean, when they're reading off the files, you know, they list a couple other things. She doesn't have goals. Sure. She has a lot of casual sex. Yeah. You know what I find interesting is they even list off contrarianism yeah. as well, one of the reasons. They give her some diagnosis, which is borderline blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And Lisa says, yeah, so is everybody. What yeah, else? Right. All right. So 40 years later, we can definitely look back now and say these things that were considered social taboos clearly not uh, insanity, nor should they even really be social taboos. Mm-hmm. But to think not even 40 years, but maybe 20 years, maybe even 10 years from now, the kind of things we can look back at what's changed over the last 10 years and the things we consider insane today might become complete norms, mm-hmm. you know, 10, 20 or sure. a, an entire 40 years from now. I mean, if we really look at that era, you know, we've talked about the 70s so much mm-hmm. on the show. And uh, and even the 60s and stuff like Easy Rider, if we look back at her, you know, her psychiatric chart today, and I think that's part of the the great thing, looking at a, a memoir from the mm-hmm. 60s, looking at a movie set in the 60s, is that we can say, all right, no goals, casual sex. Didn't that basically define that era? Yeah, it I mean, really don't did. we now think about but at least didn't. counterculture as that? But it didn't. It didn't define the institution of that era. That era was defined by the counterculture. Right, that's true. And that explains why they treat them the way they do. But it just makes them an even bigger laughing stock now. Mm-hmm. I also think one of the offshoots of that, it really points out the hypocrisy in the sexual expectations of women versus men, particularly in that era, in that decade or the decades mm-hmm. that followed. But I think a lot of that still stands now. They only make a, a point of pulling that aside once. And, you know, Winona Ryder's character basically says, if it were a guy, what would be, you know, the expectation there? 
And this is the, the really the only thing I have to say about soft sciences versus regular yeah. science. Um, because I don't know a lot. I'm, I'm just pleading complete ignorance about most of the soft sciences. If that were actual science with that, let's just say that particular person, because I don't want to say all soft sciences do this. I don't know anything about soft sciences. But you might take a case like that and actually address the issue rather than asking more fucking learn about yourself sure. through it, it seems bullshit a lot, questioning. You yeah, know? it seems a lot like it's trying to guide them to find the answer than it is like to find it for themselves than right. it is trying to be an aid in both coming to the, you know, yeah. two and getting people to the looking for the same sure. answer as opposed to leading one person down a certain path. Sure, which is maybe why I don't like the term science for that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that it doesn't help people or that it isn't necessary or maybe that it isn't even uh, necessary to the degree it's used today. But rather, uh, the job is not to set up a hypothesis there. Right. The job is not for them both to, as you say, get to the bottom of a mystery. The job is one person thinks they know the answer and by asking patronizing fucking questions, hope to convince the other person of their point of view. Mm -hmm. That seems like psychological warfare to me, not science. Speaking of psychological warfare, you remember when we did JCVD and Bronson? Oh, yeah. Oh, how could you forget? I remember one of the things we talked about is the prison system and yeah. not knowing. And while we're going over a, a bulleted, you know, a checklist of the things we don't know, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and say prison system still have no idea. Yeah. Probably even less information I have now than yeah, I did back then. That's probably true. But uh, another heavy theme would be reformation via, I guess, institutionalization. If institutionalizing someone, putting them in a home for crazies, if that's actually going to help reform them. So the question then becomes, does being with crazies make you crazier? Yeah. And I think the film clearly draws a line somewhere mm -hmm. on, that, on that point. Yeah. But it also brings Don't you up usually draw a point on the line. Isn't that typically how that works? But it also brings up a counterpoint on the same line that is to say that it's possible that she actually is creating her own problem right. and that it's entirely not fostered by the surroundings. Because eventually uh, we get the, you know, touching matron mommy scene where, uh, what is it, <laughs> don't drop anchor here, that scene? Yeah, I think that's what that is. Where it seems like... She's had the power in her all along, and it's been her the whole time. And so it's possible that maybe the people around her have only just kind of served as a cushion for her to lose her own mind. Yeah. But at the same time, it turns out also Lisa's gone during this self-discovery, which could point in the direction of, you know, insanity begets insanity. Yeah. Or it could also say she's having a breakdown because Lisa's gone. Look at the codependency mm -hmm. she's built up. It's hard to know if that, that kind of revelation came about because she was without Lisa and Lisa was a bad influence, or if it came about because being without Lisa made her nuts. She reached rock bottom and then she had to go up from mm -hmm. there. She Something snapped in her and she said, I got to get the fuck out of here. I don't think either necessarily say that the crazy around her isn't what's, uh, what's affecting her. Um, I don't think those, those things are mutually exclusive at all. I mean, I think it's very possible that, all right, so after Elisa leaves, Susanna starts treating uh, Valerie, you know, the nurse, uh, like Janet did in uh -huh. the beginning. When we first saw Susanna show up, Janet was the real nut job mm -hmm. in the place. We only see her character briefly. Sure. But she's, you know, um, throwing racial insults at yeah. her and singing the song. She just sounds like a nut job, mm -hmm. a complete fucking, she's the craziest person in the place. Right. And now we get to this point where Susanna, who is the, clearly the most sane person in the place, we almost thought her character was, you know, one-upping the nurses and uh, the doctors, that she was more sane than any of those people because she didn't buy into it. Right. And now here she is all the way down where Janet is. You know, you cannot tell me that she would have exhibited that same behavior in the beginning of the no, movie. No, absolutely not. You know, she wouldn't even know what that kind of crazy looks like. And she might have gotten mad as she was when Lisa left and when people are talking down to her, but she wouldn't behave the same way. You know, that insanity is a symptom of her anger in that, in that particular scenario. She's in that bathtub and she's just going nuts and she's not actually losing her mind, her grip on reality. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, you know, in my unprofessional opinion, need to be medicated or anything extreme like that, right. but she's just angry. And the, the form that that's manifesting itself in 
happens to be talking like a nut job. Mm -hmm. And so now she looks like a nut job does in the same way that Janet looks like a nut job does. And as we're walking by these people and they're exhibiting crazy behaviors, I'm kind of asking myself, are they all just behaving the way their peer set behaves? Right. I mean, isn't that kind of what you do in life? Sure. I guess, yeah, that makes sense. It's absolutely uh, the way things work in just about any other scenario. I mean, that's how you learn for, like, say, a job. Yeah. You An office job, for example. You sure. go into an office job and you behave the way everyone else behaves because right. they're, you know, they're... They have seniority. They know the ropes. They've been there. They know how things work. They have an idea. You're adapting to your environment, too. And so I think until the day you die, you're constantly learning and making progress as a person. And part of that progress is to mimic your peers. And so it kind of raises this question that, of course, we don't have hard evidence here. We're just examining what a movie has to add Mm -hmm. to the uh, collective knowledge or, I guess, uh, better stated, the collective conversation about that. But the piece it's adding definitely seems to be suggesting hanging around with the crazies makes you look like a fucking crazy. Yeah. Which gets us back to the great Brittany Murphy. Right. So Daisy seems a lot more sane in the house. Sure. Well, when she's she's put in a different element, the re- you brought up the refrigerator. Yeah. So let's look at the, the behavior between the two. When she's in the institution, she's storing a bunch of chickens under her bed. She looks like the most fucking insane person there. She's not taking showers. The whole thing is just fucking mad. When she gets a house, her leftover chickens are just kind of stored in the refrigerator, which is a little nutty, but not really that nutty. I mean, probably all that's sitting in my refrigerator right now is mustard and Mountain Dew. Now, if I had a bunch of that hiding under my bed, I would look like a crazy person. Mm-hmm. But since it's in my refrigerator, it's it's in its own compartment put away over there where people would it's have to go looking for it. It's in the place where food goes. Yeah, it's in the place where food goes. Now it's sane. You know, she's self-destructive. And so that might put her in the the realm of insane. But she's also asking about money, about a safety net. Uh, The cutting seems more like the actual problem there, not the symptom. Mm -hmm. She's not cutting because she's a nut job. She's still doing some crazy stuff, but she appears more normal. Sure. And so she's gone from an insane person who cuts because she's insane and stores food because she's insane. And now she's just a little bit off. And she cuts, and that's the actual problem. Right. She's not cutting because she's insane. She just happens to be cutting, and that's not an okay thing to do. Right. Well, I mean, eventually it kind of comes out that perhaps the insanity lies in the fact that she enjoys getting (laughs) fucked by her dad. Sure. Which, I mean, that's an absolute subjective point. She gets accused of that. Nobody ever says whether or not that's the case. And, I mean, I can see, yeah, that's a form of insanity, but it's not... It's a different kind. That's the kind that she has been born and raised into. Yeah, I guess I don't so much want to make the point that she's not insane. I don't want to come off like I'm saying that. I just think it's interesting how once we get her in the house, how it's in a different wrapping. Sure. And suddenly it doesn't look nearly as bad. Absolutely. More so than that revealing how not bad it is for her, because it's still bad. She's she's cutting herself, and eventually she kills herself, right? Uh So, I mean, that's if there's a fucking definition of insane... I think killing yourself is the point where someone needs some intervention, right? Right, right about uh, before that point. But it does make you think about all these people uh, who live in that lifestyle, who have a nice house, and who have their chickens stored in the refrigerator that you don't even question. And if those people can get away with crazy stuff, like cutting themselves, how normal must those people look if they want to be a writer or a lesbian? Right. Is this feeling a little heavy to you? Yeah, it's. I mean, we're talking about reform, and I, my mind is only going in one place at this point. It's the theme song, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So the theme song is really the best way to start reform school girls. Sure. After you've uh, you've been pondering the uh, the thought provoking questions mm-hmm. of a movie like Girl Interrupted, Reform School Girls starts out in the hardest '80s that it could start Absolutely. in with a titular theme song. Sure. I don't know how many of these we've uh, we've had on the show. Shaft, I suppose. Sure. And that might be it. Hard Rock Zombies, did that have a titular theme song? I don't song? think it did. So we're really doing something pretty different here. I think Big Trouble in Little China had one. Oh, yeah, that, uh, that might be true, Maybe they're all too. in the 80s, aside from Shaft. So we get this title, and we get the change in mood. A-S-A fucking P. I cannot believe <laughs> how quickly we go from one tone to a completely different yeah. one. Uh, I think the moment we do that, oh, it's probably the moment we turn the movie on, but... Yeah. Also, when it, you get that freeze frame, uh-huh. you know, or right after school girls wipes across the yeah. uh, across the screen. Now we're doing the exploitation. Mm-hmm. Now we're uh, we're venturing into, let's say, women in prison territory. Sure. 
So you say women in prison territory. Yeah. And that's an important distinction because we already covered the Big Cannibal Bird Holocaust Cage. Holocaust and the Big Bird right. Cage, right. Um, Big Bird Cage being our women in prison kind of debut sure. on Double Feature. Fitting into, I guess, what would be an even more narrow, uh, I think it's jungle women in yeah. prison or perhaps women in jungle prison. Sure. Either Which, of those is it's great. it's strange how these these uh, fit into these really specific mm-hmm. subcategories of you know when you look at exploitation road exploitation makes makes sense and uh-huh. cannibal stuff makes sense but then you start to see things like nun exploitation right and you realize that an exploitation director just decided fuck it I'm just gonna make the movie I want by the time you get to women in jungle prison. You know, it's just one dude. One yeah. dude came up with that genre and said, this is a genre now because I'm going to make eight movies and put yep. them in that. That's true. So you don't think this is really uh, women in prison? Then? No, I think I think that it's definitely seen women in prison movies. I know it's sure. based on a women in prison ideal. Right. And you have women who are locked up together and things get hot and thongy and right. it's all women the whole film it's following some of our uh, some of our conventions of sure. women in prison films but i think that the 80s sucks all of the women in prisonness out of it <laughs> right um there's a little too much punk rock to be yeah, a woman well, in prison there's, film there's i wouldn't say too much sure, punk rock sure. I would say that there is punk rock. There ain't room enough for both the punk rock and the women in prison. That's might probably be. about right. Sure, sure. In fact, the only way that the punk rock and the women in prison can manifest itself in the same way is Wendy O. Williams. Yeah, what an interesting, I was going to say actor. Let's yeah. Say, yeah, let's go with actor. Sure. This is a movie. Human what an being. interesting actor. <laughs> Human being is the one I was going for. Tell me about Wendy O. Williams. So Wendy O. Williams plays Charlie. Yeah. Um, the big bull dyke with all with all of her own clothing. So the most important note about this film, not at all, <laughs> but Charlie's clothing, Charlie's wardrobe is all right. out of Wendy O's closet. Perfect. So Wendy O. Williams is a punk singer from the band The Plasmatics, which got started in 1980, mm-hmm. right when punk was really getting big. She's, I guess becoming mainstream at that right. point, or really mainstream. Yeah. She's all about female empowerment. She's a big anarchist, you know, just a motherfucker. She's against right. censorship. She's against rebellion against everything. She's basically part of that bra burning feminism yeah. that Winona Ryder's character was uh, almost mocking in the previous film. Yeah, exactly. But Wendy O. Williams is she's all about free speech. She she went on some TV show mm-hmm. um intent they had to, you know, you know, T V play live. The Jay Leno I think still does it. Is Something he still like on that. TV? I don't know. She wanted to go on and play this song Topless. Right. And they said, Well, you can't do that. So she put black tape on her nipples and that became her trademark. Awesome. Was black tape on her nipples and she would rock and roll with the plasmatics. Fantastic. So she ends up killing herself. If this is not an homage to the last film, I don't know what is. But she ends up killing herself under the pretense that she'd rather die young than get old and fade away as a out-of-touch musician. Sure, sure. And in the film, she does the score. She does the Reform School Girls theme. She also does three other songs. And apparently the people who made the film heard her first solo record after the Plasmatics split up in yeah. 83 or 84 and decided this this right here needs to be in right. what's going on in here. Sure. And I honestly believe that Charlie Wendy O. Williams is possibly my favorite part of the film. Yeah, without her it is women in prison. It's sure. just doing the uh the conventions. So I've seen uh I've seen it called a satire of women yeah. in prison films. Yeah. And I think the I think reason that... for that is, you know, having those rock elements yep. to it. Especially the music. Mm-hmm. I say especially the music, but especially the Wendy O. Williams. Let's right. just say that. Yeah. Right. I think a lot of the satire element comes from the matron, um, Edna, yeah, right. played by Pat Ast, <laughs> right, right. who in real life was apparently wouldn't even walk on the ground if it was too soft. Sure, sure. But in the film, she is she is the '80s joke yeah. that the '70s were missing in women women in prison films. She's chubby and ugly and loud, right. and she's another detraction from the '70s version of women in prison films. Yeah, I don't know. I always viewed reform school girls as just getting up to that point, mm-hmm. you know, as if the uh, the matron or the warden or whatever that figure. I mean, we have a, a separate warden here, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Let's call her head nurse. Sure. Uh, just kept escalating with each movie until it got to this point where it was sure. just completely fucking ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. It was so 80s. So I don't know if they're necessarily pointing back at that and making fun of it. 
so much as just doing it ab- mm-hmm. <laughs> far above and beyond how it's sure. ever been done before. If you want to talk about something that's never been done before, do not talk about Reform School Girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already mentioned a uh, a different movie under that title, but I don't think that's what you're no. referring to. The director, Tom DeSimone, who did a whole bunch of gay movies in the 70s. Are the, Is it all pornographic? Or I don't think so. I think they're exploited. I think it's like gay exploitation sure okay so the whole story behind reform school girls is that he really wanted to do a women in prison movie back in its heyday in the 70s yeah and he tried and he felt like the film fell flat oh so he tried again he didn't remake the first film (laughs) he just basically recycled the plot and it fell flat a second time so he said oh fuck it we'll just do it again yeah we'll we'll do another one Uh uh-huh and uh that didn't work either right so instead it's now the 80s he's done a bunch of uh other gay exploitation movies under the pseudonym lancer brooks we have to find out if this is exploitation or pornography i'm interested somebody send us an email yeah lancer brooks and its infinite subtlety oh Oh, great great um So he decides, okay, third one, let's go for the gold. Let's get this plasmatics chick in here. Let's get Sybil Danning to do something. We'll dress her up like Ilsa, she-wolf of the SS. Oh, my God. This one's going all the way. Let's crash a bus into something. This was before Sybil Danning was in uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween or Werewolf Women of the SS. (laughs) Long before Werewolf Women of the SS. But it's funny because you do kind of make that Ilsa compare. I think part of that is, the, you know, the outfit she's and wearing. And the haircut. Yeah, you get a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Actually, you get a lot of that is what you get. Believe it or not, if you watch this film, you've seen some of these people before. Uh-huh. Or if you're watching the other double feature stuff. Um, I'll save the really good one for last. The first okay. one's Tiffany Helm. She was in Friday the 13th 5. Okay. And we talked about that in the very first Killapalooza we ever did. And then there's uh, there's actually several from the Freddy's Nightmares TV, the TV shows. TV series, yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple actors that came from that. I think... Um, well, and the director was involved with that as well. Perfect, so that's where those people come from. But the one that was pretty fucking amazing to me is Sherry Stoner. Yeah. Who, I mean, Sherry Stoner was a writer on a bunch of interesting uh, Disney stuff mm-hmm. and kids stuff. She did um, The Animaniacs. And I she love The Animaniacs. And she was producer on a lot of that kind of tiny tunes and pinky in the brain stuff that seems to just keep cropping up. I think during Ed Wood, we talked about some uh-huh. of that stuff. And also she wrote the, uh, the she co-wrote, I guess the movie Casper with Christina Ricci. Wow. Yeah. And then beyond that, she was the body model for, um, I think it's Ariel. The, which one is that? The mermaid the one? The little right? mermaid. The little mermaid. So right. If, if you watch reform school girls, you get to see Ariel's body model naked. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Every young boy's fantasy. Yeah. And the character from beauty and the beast. I don't remember what bell bell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So bell from beauty and the beast as well. And I think they modeled some of the animations off a uh, body gesture she made wow. or something of that effect. This is getting steamy. Yeah, it certainly is. I love when you find out about people who were in the Disney little princess kind of shit and they're in these completely They're getting obscene... their ass burned by a bunch of bull dykes. Oh, right, right. It's beautiful. It's amazing. So while we're on the topic of ass burning, uh, that's really one of the sexier moments of mm-hmm. the film. You might expect women in prison films to be very sexy, and I maybe I'm alone here. Mm-hmm. Um, no, obviously I, there's different uh, there's different. I would fetishes definitely for... say that women in prison films is it's that's if we were to if we were to uh, integrate the genre, I would put it in a subcategory of sexploitation. Yeah, sure, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say I find it sexy in the least. Okay. And I don't know if that's Edna or the chicken parts. Uh-huh. I mean, the movie tells me it kind of doesn't want to be sexy. Yeah. Um, the, especially reform school girls, you have the thing about the ice box, yeah. you know, Joey and the, the little bunny yeah. rabbit. Yeah. There's some, that doesn't really, belong in a sexy film. Some really dark. The, the thing that's strange is, is a lot of the sexy stuff is all haphazard. This woman's wearing sexual lingerie. Right, this right. one's topless, but immediately it's like for a, a really good example for me is when it closes in on Charlie's girl's asses. Right. And in a, perfect world you get a, a close-up on some naked chicks butt sure but instead there's a burn and it's it's <laughs> right. branding their female cattle for this yeah, giant yeah. strong lesbian sure and it's not the same as it would be if it were you know the exact same shot with some wah and a little bit of a slow hi-hat yeah right right so that's uh, that's one of the ways that exploitation separates itself from straight pornography or gay pornography in the uh, in the case of this director. You know, when we look at some of the Russ Meyer stuff, that always becomes a very blurred line. Mm-hmm. And 
what's pornography? Is it pornography just for Russ Meyer? If we don't find it sexual, does it go into exploitation instead? Women in prison, I mean, part of it I always thought was just that it's 80s lingerie, which I particularly do not find sure, sexual in the least. But when we see something like Reform School Girls, we have branding and we have these weird anecdotes and gross out moments and chicken parts. Kitten stomping. Yeah. And I think to myself, are we supposed to find this sexy in the least? Or is it more... I mean, when I think about sexploitation and then I guess women in prison and anything that falls under that, I always think it's more one step away from... uh uh, you know, the kind of sci-fi or horror comics at the time, sure. that sort of strange tales, uh-huh. you know, these uh, these tales of the bizarre sort mm-hmm. of things, even though it doesn't quite venture into, you know, pulp comic book monster territory. Right. It's still this, it's more like an odd fascination. It's like a twisted penthouse letter where maybe there's something sexual in the story or in just the genre of the story, but the story itself is it's just more twisted. It's for people who want to look at uh, the twisted, the absurd, or, or I guess the perverse, and uh, want to do that for about an hour and 20 minutes. Sounds about right. The other thing that sets Reform School Girls apart from something like The Big Bird Cage uh-huh. or... Women in Cages. Yeah, or really a lot of the movies that came before, is that this is pretty much an all-women cast. Uh-huh. There's what, one dude in the entire thing? Yeah, two, maybe. Similar to Girl Interrupted. Uh And that's kind of why I love this double feature is it's just, you see a ton of women actors playing roles that, you know, when we looked at The Descent, that was another all-women cast. And so by definition, you get to compare the different roles that these women are playing. Even if they're written by one person, you can really then see what the actors are each bringing to those individual roles, Mm -hmm. especially if they're written by a male director. So despite how fucking punk rock this director is or how many chicks he hangs out with in his free time or what kind of, you know, subcultures he identifies with, he's still writing from a single, let's say a single person's perspective sure. then. And so he's either the most brilliant fucking writer ever and he can write, you know, 50 individual unique female roles without ever having been a female himself. Or he writes pretty standard female roles, mm-hmm. which in a movie like this, I think that's probably what yeah, we're seeing. I would say so. And then each woman is bringing her own mm-hmm. element to uh, to the characters. You don't get to see that a lot except with uh, a movie that's written and, uh, I guess, cast in this way. Yeah, that's true. And and you kind of see all of the characters, all of the, the female archetypes really come to a head at the finale scene. Right, right. That's where is, they start to blend into one well, rather yeah, than having where, you know their standout roles. That's exactly. where they unify. Yeah, you you see basically everybody all the all the female roles have all the weak weak characters have kind of died out. Yeah. And eventually you just get this concoction of the strong female archetype all clashing because, you know, some are on this side of the battle and some are on the other side. You get Edna climbing the fucking tower, right. shooting, shouting about control, killing all these. There people. is something very King Kong about that, right? Was, it's yeah, not just oh, me. Totally. All right. I wanted to make sure that that wasn't just me being a, a huge fucking jerk. Yeah. I think that reinforces my point about the writers that in the end, when we don't get to see the individual unique actors mm-hmm. shine, that's where we get one collective. That's sure. just the voice of the, the written stuff coming yeah, through. Yeah, exactly. And With the exception, maybe, of Wendy's character. Yeah, right. Well, Wendy climbs on top of a fucking bus. Oh, man, awesome. And <laughs> somehow gets it to drive forward. I'm not going to question it because of how fucking cool it looks. Yeah. With her, with her fist in the air, shouting about how it's fucking over for Edna. After smashing through the glass. Yeah, <laughs> right. half naked. Doing in the thong, whole thing in a thong. And it's just this wonderful poster of exploitation for me. This half naked punk rocker on top of a bus about to take down the authoritarian figure. That's all I ever want from a women in prison film. A glorious ending perfectly capitalizes, evangelizes perhaps that uh, that whole fucking culture. Mm-hmm. I guess we have a website is we do what we do website. at this point, right? Uh-huh. Doublefeatureshow.com, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, and donate.doublefeatureshow.com if you want to uh, recommend a couple movies. So we're going to pick out two movies that people recommend, and we're coming up on the end of the year. We're going to do uh, one recommendation from two different people, pair them up, have a double feature at the end of the year. A listener requested crazy fucking double That sounds like a total disaster. An even better disaster is uh, the manipulation of our theme that the subscribers will do. So if you have a... So if you go on the website and you do the subscription thing, 
you can record a little voice memo on your phone or send it via the email or we'll uh, we'll get a number together you can call. You can up. mail us a cassette tape. Actually, don't do that because I don't have what's that called, a cassette decoder or uh, encoder. A track Take deck. the player, cassette player. Deck, I don't have a yeah. cassette uh, player. Oh, what a disaster. So we'll take our bright, brilliant, lovely theme and we'll chop it the fuck up and put the listeners in the theme. A lot of people don't know this, but we those are all just friends of ours, yeah. acquaintances. Uh, people we know doing the voices that uh-huh. you wrote up in yep. the theme. <laughs> so the beauty of that is that we can extract those. We can just toss them the fuck out and put you guys in there instead, yep. which is going to be amazing. It's donate.doublefeatureshow.com for that. Uh-huh. And bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com if you're super interested in the memoir that uh, Girl Interrupted is based on. I believe it's called Girl Interrupted. Whoa. You can get that for free on there. Bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com. The two movies we're doing next time it's uh, it's a gaming extravaganza. Yeah, we're going to get a little heavy on video games, despite what everybody in our listenership wants to tell us. They could just gonna, listen to the Girl Interrupted segment yeah, again, right? They we're don't defying need to tune in Podmanity week. for a week, I guess, is what's going on. That's good to do, like, once every other week. So. Yeah, we just alienate the audience, bring them back in, alienate them. So we're going to do Tron and Scott Pilgrim versus the world. So we're doing the original Tron, not the new screwy thing. Uh-huh. Although that'll inevitably come up, too. Those are secretly the same fucking movie. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about both of them those tron scott pilgrim awesome get ready for some arcade shit and watch more fucking film beep boop